The northern mountains were a mountain range in northern Scarith. They were the site where the Black River emptied into the Silver Sea, and their tallest peaks towered over tree canopies. Their climate was generally chilly, with wind from the Silver Sea constantly blowing up and through the area. They were also characterized by long dark winters with permanent snowfall, and the tallest peaks were always capped by snow, which resisted even the heat of the three suns. Steam produced by hot springs traveled through hundreds of underground pathways leading to geysers, which the Vapra would use to hone their flying skills. The mountains were rich in natural resources, especially gems and metals, including iron, which could be made into steel. Standing four or five times the height of a full-grown gelfling, a galloping landstrider is a visually imposing sight. But looks can be deceiving. Landstrider are peaceful, empathic animals that can be trained to become trusty steeds. Gelflings see the landstrider-rider relationship as a partnership to be nurtured, rather than viewing the creatures simply as a form of convergence. They are resilient creatures with tough leathery hides and downy shocks of fur that they shed seasonally. Below their tangle of whiskers, they have small, toothless mouths with long, insectable tongues suited for lapping up nectar and stripping leaves from tall branches. While mostly docile in nature, landstriders are more than capable of defending themselves, and their riders, with powerful kicks. Windsifters were insects characterized by their soft, downy wings, thread-like antennae, rotund bodies and small, expressive eyes. They had prodigious memories and great stamina, and were thus domesticated by the Gelfling during the Age of Harmony to act as couriers. They came in many different shapes and sizes, from the brightly colored Great Scarlet Windsifter to the comparatively drab Lowland Speckled Windsifter. Many Gelflings spent their lives selectively breeding the animals for new varieties. Despite their wide usage, some Gelfling preferred using Swuthu rather than Windsifters, as the latter were more likely to heed the Song of Thray rather than follow instructions, and their smaller size made them impracti. Cal for delivering anything heavier than a letter or small object. Naturally occurring in all but the most inhospitable regions of Thray. Unamoths begin life as tiny larvae, no bigger than a podling thumb. Once they gestate and unfurl their massive, segmented wings, hover, they can fro several times larger than some varieties of predatory birds. The chrysalis that a larval unamoth builds as part of its transition to adulthood is an intricate and colorful creation reminiscent of blown glass. Sharp olives were birds, diurnal cousins of olives, but were different in that they had brighter plumage with vibrant blues and yellows and possessed a more flamboyant song delivered in a higher tonal range that was sweet to the ear. Able to fly at incredible altitudes, their talons and feathers would often be tipped with frost when they dove back to the ground. Sharp olives would shed and regrow their beaks as they matured, with their new bills having a sharp edge and a fresh golden sheen. Treasure hunters from the Vapra clan would bring discarded beaks back from the mountains believing they had struck gold, only to be disappointed when they showed them to local merchants. Grot was a mountain range located in eastern Scarith, it was thought to be the source of the Black River, and contained a vast network of caves, carved through thousands of trine by underground streams. These caves went as deep as the heart of Thray itself, and pulsated with white crystal veins. The climate within the caves of Grot was consistently cool, and saw little sunlight save for pinpricks of it penetrating through the roofs of certain caverns. Grot was originally the domain of the Arotham, who dug many of its tunnels. They were driven out by the Skeksis during the early Age of Division, and their former territory colonized by the Groton clan. Grot's interior climate made it an ideal habitat for fungi, of which there were a thousand different varieties, as well as cave-dwelling plants. Most plants consisted of root vegetables and mosses, with leafy vegetables only growing outside on the surface. Some mushrooms were bioluminescent, a trait which they used to attract insects, which would carry their spores throughout the caverns. Many of these plants and fungi were harvested by Groton alchemists and herbalists for their medicinal qualities.
The Macraques were a race native to Skarath's underground caverns, characterized by their thick, chitinous shells, glowing yellow eyes and prehensile antennae. Being specialized for a subterranean life, they found living on the surface world extremely painful, with even the air being poisonous to them. They were capable of wading through magma unscathed and their internal body temperature was so high that raindrops would evaporate on contact with their skin. They spoke a language consisting of rapid clicks. They were a proud race which excelled at mining and engineering, and were adept tool users, using hammers and picks to burrow their way underground. They were minimalists when it came to clothing, limiting themselves to loincloths and sandals. The Arathum were a family of sentient arthropod-like creatures, sporting innumerable subspecies which differed in size and number of limbs. LL subspecies were psychically united by a hive mind known as the Ascendancy. That's a psychic link that allows them to share their thoughts and emotions with one another, no matter where they are on the surface of T. He planet. Then the Ascendancy needs to communicate with the others races of Thray, a group of Arathum link bodies to form what appears to be a face. Coordinating the movement of their legs and thoraxes, the Arathum make the face, speak, delivering the Ascendancy's message to friends and foes alike. With six large limbs that can be used for stabbing and rending, spitters are the warrior caste of Arathum society. There are two different kinds of spitters, poison spitters expectorate caustic gobs of venom, blinding their prey before attacking, silk spitters produce thick ropes of unbreakable silk, which can be used in battle to subdue opponents. The silk spitters also utilize their secretions to build webs and other Arotham structures. Armaligs are greenish in tint, with a domed head, segmented insectal body, and large sad eyes. Their six small, stocky legs give them a distinctive trot that is neither imposing nor graceful. But when their chitinous body segments are tucked into a sphere, head under hind, these creatures can roll themselves at incredible speed, attaining a momentum that can knock down trees and crash through stone. Wild armalegs are mostly docile and indifferent to observers. However, should a wild armalig feel threatened, it will roll away from danger at remarkable speed. And beware any poor creature not fast enough to get out of its way. Common armaligs were domesticated during the Age of Division by the Skeksis to act as wheels to their carriages, which they could propel at great speeds, while the dwarf variety was hunted as a food source by the Groton clan, wild armaligs suffered a great decline throughout this period. Nurlocks were large, peaceful worm-like creatures native to the caves of Grot. They had long, ridged bodies perfectly adapted for navigating caverns. The number of eyes and body segments varied with age, with fully grown specimens sporting the most. Nurlock often five off a faint bioluminescent glow, the result of eating glow moss found within the caves. They are farmed BYT the Groton, Nurlock milk and cheese form the clan's main food source. When the creature die, Groton try to utilize every part of the animal to honor its lives. Nurlock leather is particularly valuable and prized for its softness. Hollerbats are avian mammals native to Grot, characterized by their beady yellow eyes, dark red fur and long membranous fingers. The latter trait allow them to rapidly navigate through stalagmites and stalactites. They are, however, easily exhausted in long flights and had to rest frequently. Because of their poor eyesight and aversion to eating glow moss, hollerbats compensated by using their hollering cries as a form of sonar. Despite being widely considered a nuisance among Gelfling, hollerbats were nevertheless vital components to Grot's ecosystem, as their droppings fertilized the glow moss which nourished nurlocks and other subterranean animals. This fertility was due to the hollerbats consuming sun-enriched foods during nocturnal hunting trips outside Grot. Zanid birds were subterranean creatures native to Grot. They were the natural predators of nurlocks which they attacked in packs, stabbing them with their tail stingers and injecting them with a corrosive venom which liquefied the victim, allowing the Zanid birds to suck up the melted remains. They were greatly feared by Groton shepherds, as their silent depredations were rarely detected in time, and could wipe out entire Nurlock herds in a single attack. Tidalbit descendants of simple life forms that existed at the birth of Thray, Tidalbit are puddle dwellers that crawl along the bottom of ancient tide pools in the deepest regions of Grot. Though their anatomy is simple, they have developed a rudimentary language, purring and bubbling away in the darkness, even pausing to let their neighbors in nearby pools speak. 
The Ruswa is a serpentine predator with reflective green eyes and a chin that buckles under the weight of its massive underbite. Eel-like in anatomy, these amphibious pack animals work together to corner prey both in and out of water. It can be found in the marshes of Sog and the underground rivers of Grot. Luckily, they are not large enough to be a threat to Jelfling, but the aggressive creature can still deliver an extremely painful bite. 